You're going to learn something today that is going to blow you away. Welcome to Susan Blackwood. Susan, what are you going to do today? Well, today I'm going to take what we typically have when we're outside painting plain air. We do this beautiful scene. We come home and we go, huh, yeah, it kind of looks like the photograph, but it doesn't have that power, that romance. So I'm going to show you using some techniques that I have developed called concepts. And we're going to take this painting and we're going to apply some of those. And fingers crossed, it's going to be a much more powerful painting. So oh, uh, well, you're you're a pro. You're going to nail it. You're going to okay. knock it out of the park. I just know you're going to be great. You have been painting for a long time. Well, let's get right into it, and we'll okay. chat along the way and get to know you a little better. So, okay. all right. So you need to change your camera. What do you need to do? Um. Yes, I'm. I'm going to switch this back. To all right. Camera. So today, folks, is 200, excuse me, day 308, and it's interesting because today I'm kind of juggling two worlds, right? I promised you guys I'd be here every day uh, from the time coronavirus quarantine began, and uh, so I'm still here, but I wanted to show you that um, today is also Watercolor Live Day, so today's the beginning of Watercolor Live and it's already going on as we speak, and uh, it's beginner day at Watercolor Live. If you want to join in, you can leave me here and go over to Watercolor Live and still get most of the program. And remember, there's replays on anything that you missed, but uh, it's phenomenal. we got a massive audience. It's the world's largest. Seriously, no art conference in the world has ever been bigger than this one, and this is pretty cool. 38 countries attending. So uh, come on over and join us later after Susan. But uh, Susan, are you ready now? I am. Okay. I'm going to go right to your screen here. It looks like, oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, that reminds me of a place. <laughs> it is a place. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's true. You know, when, when you were here, uh, you and your husband, Howard, came to the very first Publishers Invitational in Austin. Yeah. We and we, I don't know if you were with me, but we went down to the bank of a river and there was an old bridge like that. It reminds me of that scene. Well, this is the Axtell Bridge that's outside of Bozeman, Montana, where we used to live and moved just recently uh, to Arkansas. And um, there was a gang of us that would go out and paint every Saturday morning. And we called us the... Uh, um, uh, Gang of Saturday morning painters. Yeah, Jade, Jade Street <laughs> plain air painters because we lived on Jane's Jade Street, and um, we always met there at the same place. There was so much to paint. You could, in any direction. There was farmland. There was rivers. There was, and this bridge I did right before I left. Um, I was very excited about this bridge, but you can see in this bridge, I'm kind of conflicted between: is this the subject matter, or is this the subject matter? And it, I, I was very happy with this painting until I came home and I thought I could do better with this. Well, so that, that's, that happens with plein air paintings, right? You've got all this information. You're trying to take it all in. And and uh, then you get home and you go, oh. Yeah. Let, uh, why it. did I do quite what I did? Yeah. Um, or did I not finish it? And I think what you can see is this conflict between the two. Whenever you put uh, something that's man-made in a painting – you can have it disguised and it's still going to pull the eye all the way back. Um, an animal, a person, or a man-made thing. And that's what's happening here. And I did emphasize this as my center of interest. But the more I looked at it, I thought, let's apply some principles to this. So number one, I am going to do dark to light, rich colors to muted colors that alone is going to help. I've also already did done hard edges to soft edges. So let's see if I can just tint this down. So what are you going to make your center of interest? The rocks? I'm going to, the rocks are going to grab you first, but then you're going to come back because that's a human thing. You're going to get back in there. So right. let's see if I can pull this off. Okay. Um, it's so much fun to do. So I like what you've done on the bridge. I just want to point that out to everybody who might not understand this, that just the rails on the bridge, if you imagine there's rails in the front and then uh, there's a little drive through it and then there's rails on the other side. I love how you've lightened and softened those rails on the other side. That just makes it pulls you through. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was one of the problems is they were all black and having this, it almost was like having calligraphy yeah. or lettering at the top. So I wanted to push that back, but I just don't think I accomplished it as much because you know we have atmosphere perspective um, where things move back in the atmosphere. I'm going to take just a little bit of up. Oh, that and sometimes bad. you have to fake it, though, to make it read right. <laughs> sometimes? Always? <laughs> I think the... The uh, big thing with artists is we need to use our imagination. It's one thing, it's a wonderful skill to get out there and um, capture it exactly the way it is. But in reality, we are uh, visionaries. Hey, and what, what the heck are you doing down there anyway? Oh, I, I, have, I put out a, the wrong color. So I'm just. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Um, here well, we while you're doing that, let me just uh, mention something to everybody. Uh, yesterday, we announced that we're giving away a digital subscription to Plein Air Magazine. Uh, the digital subscription has 20% more content than the print edition, so a lot of people get both. Anyway, Nora Harvey from Ontario, Canada is our winner. So congratulations to Nora. Woo! Don't start painting yet, Susan. Don't start painting. Oh. And then, uh, and then uh, today's prize, in, in, you got to leave comments. Tell us where you're from. If you're new, tell us you're new. Uh, we're going to give away an easel brush clip from easelbrushclip.com. Okay, oh, Susan, you're that. on. Oh, I'm you're, on? Okay. You're on. Okay, here we go. So the first thing I did is I'm lightening this. I mean, I love this bridge, but we go to it too fast, and then we get stuck there. So by romancing it a little bit, pushing it back into the distance a little bit, getting some of these dark, sharp edges back. And um, when I'm on location, I'm not going to do this because the paint is really wet, but I have the advantage of doing this right now because uh, this is very dry. This was done in the summer a couple years ago, actually, before we started moving. And then I'm also pushing back the landscape back here, the uh, trees. And what, what color are you doing? It looks like a white with a blue. Yeah, this is cerulean blue with white and a tiny, tiny bit of burnt sienna, just so it's not too cold. All right. Um, so by doing that, getting it back into here, and, you know, I hate to do that because... You come home and go, oh, man, I really nailed the sparkly light back in there. But you have to let go of a lot of your pure colors. You're so, kind of blocking the camera a little with your hair. Oh, there I'm you, sorry. You um, the, the, we're gonna, can I move this over just a little bit? That'll work, won't it? Is that going to work, Eric? I don't know. Let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's helping. Um, Hard to paint cool. sideways, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> and so I actually put a, a, a table at the edge so I wouldn't step too far. But you can already see the difference between the brighter colors and the muted colors. And I muted the shore a little bit. So, so you want to push things back. You're going to mute the color. And, so and this is pure to muted, yeah. yeah. And then um, – The other thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that the foreground is more powerful. So I'm going to take some, oh, let's see, um, Viridian and Ultramarine Blue. That's, ooh, too much. Pull out, pull out. Have you ever heard of the joke about the um, two mosquitoes? No. And one mosquito is on the arm and he's, he's um, all of a sudden blows up really big. And the other mosquito says, hey, man, pull out, pull out. You hit a vein. <laughs> I think of that a lot. Pull out, pull out. So see, by automatically, by making this richer in the foreground here, but you're in deeper. See how that's pushing that back? Yeah. We can have all of that detail in there, but we don't need. And I'm going to add a little. This might be crazy. Um, a little uh, alizarin crimson down into the depths of this water. Alizarin crimson is a wonderful um, color to add to your greens because not too much, but it makes it a real rich forest, beyond forest green sometimes. Oop, artists, artists struggle with greens probably more than anything else, don't they? 
Yeah, um, I when I start with my students, I won't let them have green. I let them, they can mix. You, you them. are, you are. Oh, you're but tough. You know I make them do green charts and I make them mix the greens from, you, you have to be able to mix a green from every single color that you have on your palette. And when you go and put yourself through that test, holy moly, do you uh, learn about greens? And they never have a problem with greens after that. So see, I'm starting to build the difference here. I'm going to get some nice rich color down in here. Now talk about darks, uh, you know, uh, darks and how things recede from, from the foreground darks and so on. Yeah. Um, as things go back in the distance, we have aerial perspective. And that happens, you know, when I lived in the mountains, recently just came from Bozeman, Montana, and um, you could really see it. You see that atmosphere. But you think, oh, that's the distance mountains. But that's actually happening if you just have a bowl of fruit. It's so interesting to see. Now I'm going to soften this edge a little bit, make that transition better. Um, a bowl of fruit, if you, if you just take the ones that are up front, give that the purest color, and then slightly make them duller and lighter as they go back, and bingo, you have, the, the viewer never knows what you're doing. The viewer is innocent bystander. All they know is that they like it. And you've got a beautiful well, aerial perspective, which is what we need here. I'm going to. I got to tell you, I, I like that painting <laughs> so much more already. Really? Oh, yeah. I just, it just, you know, it made it dreamy by pushing. Push in the back, you know, when you lightened the water in the back and then darkened in the middle and then darker in the front, it all of a sudden made it come alive. Just that alone has made a huge difference. Oh, that's what I need. You know, everybody needs somebody standing by their side going, yeah, that's it. You got it. <laughs> Thanks. A director. A director. That's, yeah. well, that's what I'm hoping. And, you know, when you're painting like this, you're going so fast, especially talking at the same time, that sometimes you don't see what's going on. I paint often with a with a mirror. Um, in our big old studio in Bozeman, we actually had mirrors on wheels that we could put behind us. Um, that was pretty amazing. And what a great idea. Yeah, because you need to, if you're in a small studio, hang a mirror. Don't hang a painting of yours behind you. Hang a mirror right behind you because um, that I think that's too bright to pink. There we go. A little bit of that. Now talk about why that is. Why did you put that color in there? Well, that color has not been used any place in here. So all of a sudden that pink, it was okay when it was pale, but all of a sudden it was like, nah, I don't know. I'm going to bring some of this color up on this rock just a little bit too. Because what I want to do, oh, I have a lot to do. Um, I'm going to keep pushing those uh, trusses back just a little bit. Now this is going, I'm going to be doing negative space right here. It's not, it's positive space, but right. I'm going to create a feeling of negative space. At you're, you're almost blocking the camera again. Okay. All right. Here we go. Now, some people might not understand what negative space is. Okay. Um, everything that you can touch your hand, your face, an apple, all that is positive space generally. Um, negative space is the stuff between stuff. And, you know, as artists, we don't even pay attention to that. I mean, you do after a while. But as um, artists, most of the time, you're so busy getting the apple or the tree or, or whatnot that you forget to look at this negative space, the negative space in here this negative space. This is what builds this. We often think this is the edge, but these two shapes working together is what actually builds a really good um, painting, a composition. Now, the reason I'm doing that, and it was hard, you know, to sacrifice these this pretty trusses, but that wasn't being part of the romance. Um, years ago, I got divorced. Um, that, but the good news, I found Howard, and we are happily, happily, happily. 
Um, but I found out after not having dated for years and years and years, I started dating and, um, you know, you'd go, we'd go out and I'd tell him about my life. He'd tell me about his life. And then we were so bored after the first date that, um, <laughs> didn't work so I um I got smart and I said you know what I'm just going to enjoy the evening and not try to uh tell him everything about me well the next guy that came along was Howard <laughs> and I didn't tell him anything about me we had a wonderful time we did a great time he knew nothing about me and I realized that the uh, secret, that there is a point to this, the secret is to hold the attention is you don't tell everything. And here's the punchline. That's what you need to do as an artist. Don't tell everything. Let, leave, let the viewer engage their mind just enough. Now it's getting too dark. Um, just enough. <laughs> that they get involved. So that's why this is intriguing. I need to do that just a little bit more. Um, because- In other words, don't render everything. Don't, well, don't render everything, but don't tell everything either. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, now you don't have to go to this extreme, but even with the rocks back in here, before I uh, started darkening everything, um, we had a lot of detail, but nothing really clearly. I, I tell my artists a lot of times we work too hard. You know, we're trying to tell everything. Well, do two paintings if that's what you have to do. But don't tell everything in that one painting. So what I'm doing is just bringing some darks. You also, uh, you, you know, you've also pointed something else out here that may or may not be obvious to some people. And that is that you can't have typically, I, I know there's no rules, but typically... Uh, you don't want two stars in your painting. And what you've done here is you've said, okay, my foreground is going to be my star. Initially. Yeah. Initially. And then, and then you're going to draw them back there. But if, if both things are equal, then it's, yeah. it's exciting. And that, you know, what, what had happened was this is pretty interesting shape in here, but I didn't feel like it was that interesting. This is one of those things where I'm challenging that only one focal point because really this is where you go back to, but you keep coming back to here. This is, is the pointer coming up. Um, really only one focal point is all you want. Um, but this is one of those things that this one is such a mystery back in here. It feels like the river mist is just coming up. I can build that a little bit stronger here. Keep looking, keep pushing back. See, that's just a little bit light there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a little dark there. So I want to, woo. I practically have nothing on my brush now. It's just practically a dirty brush that I'm pushing that back, pushing it back. Somebody's asking, what are you using for brushes? Oh, I have a rosemary brush. This is, just, this is so cool. I have a gray matters brush. I have a Signet uh, Robert Simmons, and this one is a uh, Royal Langnickel. So Royal. you just pick brushes based on what you're going to need. Yeah, I do. Um, when I come home with new brushes from one of the, the conventions, which, by the way, is one of the great things, is it, right? They, they're still doing that? or Who is they? You. <laughs> I'm sorry. They meaning your your crew are still getting. Uh, okay, my head's going to be in the way a little bit. Well, yeah. we have uh, we have the plein air convention scheduled for Denver in May. Uh, we're, we're waiting to find out if coronavirus is going to become a problem, but yeah. it sounds like we're kind of. Uh, I think moving, we're we're heading out. I think we're it, moving beyond that. Yep, I really do. Um, I do know that uh, I have hardly had any colds this year. I mean, I haven't had any colds this year. 
So that's one of the pluses of being totally isolated. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Like we were talking, that we, you and I have talked about before, um, being able to meet online has been such a joy for Howard and I. Yeah, you're doing online teaching. I've put your website up at susanblackwood.com. Thank you. And that's where you can find her online teaching Zoom classes and so on. I have a class coming up about negative space, and it's called Let's Get Positive About Negative Space. Clever. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Well, I you like guys also, when things are normal, you take people to tour and paint in exotic yeah. places. Yeah. If the... Um, if the coronavirus will behave itself, we're supposed to go to Italy. We were supposed to go last year. And, um, and you know, of course, everybody was under masks. and Oh, the countries didn't want us in there, actually. <laughs> go away. No, we don't want anybody. They didn't want anybody in. Um, and now we're scheduled again for this June. We're going to uh, Cinque Terre. Unbelievable. Nice. And... Um, yeah. So since the coronavirus has hit, Howard and I have done, just myself, have done 15, 16 of these um, online classes. Yeah. Uh, full blown classes. Okay. Now what I've got to do, I still have time, right? Oh, yeah. You got okay. plenty of time. Oh, good. Okay. So now what I want to do, because I've knocked all my color down, I might have to knock it down just a little bit more. But now I want to bring up something in here, some darks. That signature has got to go. Don't you hate that when that happens? I don't hate it. <laughs> That's something that um, I try to tell my artists that I'm working with is – to be sure and um, make your signature not a focal point. Because sometimes the, the paint that you use is so bright or so dark that it really pulls the eye away right. from your focal point. Yeah. So uh, I was so good at this. I learned it so well when I was a watercolorist and I first started out that I would hide it in the grasses. Well, let me tell you, I'm sure there's some paintings out there that people don't even know they were by me yeah. <laughs> because it's so well hidden. Well, I have a whole thing I do on signatures, but the, the, oh. you know, the, 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 the issue is that <clears throat> uh, people will do signatures that are not readable and then nobody knows in a hundred years. I mean, I hear this from art historians all the time. I'll get a picture of a signature and they'll say, do you know who this is? Nope. <laughs> uh, and nope. And so I, you know, I write clearly about everything I possibly can about the painting, the location, who I was with painting it. Is it plein air? You know, sometimes I'll even put materials in it. If it's something that I'm doing different, uh, I'll write that all on the back so that there's at least some kind of a record. And, I'm, I'm a fan of making a signature fairly clear. Uh, you know, a lot of people put a squiggly signature on their website, which is fine, but they need, it needs to also say in type, you know, Susan Blackwood. And, oh, that, yeah. and, and so that, even if you have a squiggly signature on the front, at least, you know, put some, put some clarity into the back if they can't understand what your signature is. I've told my collectors too, because they have a lot of different artists and stuff. I said, while you still remember, your family is not going to remember all the details, but put an envelope on the back of your painting, attach it, you know, securely. Tape doesn't work. That'll fall off. And um, in that envelope, you want to put uh, that you bought this painting. Did you, did you buy it at, um, you know, where you bought it? Uh, put how much you paid for it. I mean, mm -hmm. what a great thing for somebody to find it and know exactly how much you paid for it or a copy of the receipt or something. Um, but get a history in there because in the future, could be soon, could be years from now, that um, information is going to make a huge difference for a collector. And yeah. we work so hard. I really like what you're saying about... Um, putting the information 
of what you what you thought, your thoughts. I, I love putting stories and I haven't, I did that for a while and I've kind of gotten out of the habit. Yeah. Well, I teach that in my art marketing classes is it's uh, stories are so important because people need to know the story and the story. Sometimes there, there are people who stories draw people in and there are people who have the ability to see something clearly, you know, the 50% of the population roughly can look at a painting and go, Oh, I love that painting. I got to have it. The other 50% are, you know, a, a different personality type that need a little nudging, right? And so sometimes that story will draw them in. Well, you're absolutely right because there's different people. Some people are um, visual and some people are readers. Right. And it's a different learning styles and um, you want to be able to uh, give them the ability to see exactly looking for a good brush here here we go um you want to be able to for them to see with their heart and some people just can't do it until they read something about it yeah that's right and, and so i love that you're you're teaching that well i i uh, also have artwork archive and i i don't i'm not consistent about it but i try to put my paintings in there and and <clears throat> in my collection but also my the ones that i've finished so that I can write some of that information in there. The problem is that, you know, the kids, I, I my fear is they're going to take a, you know, a really good painting, a David LaFell painting, and they're going to sell it in a garage sale or, or, yeah. you know, and, and here's a, you know, 40 or $50,000 painting that uh, they don't like. And they just say, Oh, I'll just sell it. And of course that's what pickers hope for is that there are people yeah. out there to sell things that are worthless to them. Yeah. Well, that certainly happens. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that's what I tell. So I have one collector, a huge collection. And I said, okay, COVID-19, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go through and you're going to put these envelopes on and you're going to get out all your information. And she has done that with her collection and she is so happy about it. You know, um, then it doesn't matter if you're a 20 year old that has a collection or, um, an 80 year old, it, it, your, these paintings are going to leave your hands and you've spent years loving them. Might as well give them a name and a face that, uh, can be. Well, and, and people are looking for provenance, you know, uh, dealers and so on. They want to know yeah. the, you know, the history of the painting. And if, if you're putting a letter in there that says, you know, I, I, I saw this at, at, uh, you know, Plan Air, Texas, and I, uh, I, I fell in love with it because of this. And I, you know, here's a picture of me with the artist and the painting. And, you know, those things really will help in the future. And, and you know, think about, I mean, there are paintings out there that are two, 300 years old. Wouldn't it be nice if we had that kind of information? Yeah. I got a lady the other day, by the way, women... You get married, your maiden name, maybe you were painting under your married name or you get divorced and um, there goes the provenance for your painting. So be sure to put that in, on your website, in your history, you know, even if it's a parenthesis or formerly known as because I had a lady because I had that, she contacted me with a painting that I did uh, in 1975. So... Well, how long is that? I'm 74 or 75, I can't remember. And, and you were a different name at the time? Oh, yeah. I was, it was my first marriage. And, um, and it, she found me only because she looked up my name, Susan, uh, Susan Zabinski. And um, I have included that in my, my information on my website in my bio and she was able to find me and she says, is this your painting? And I was absolutely thrilled because it was one of my absolute favorite paintings. And, you know, you sold it when I was in my twenties and who knows where it's, and then to find it moving through. And yeah, where'd she find it? At a garage sale. So she was uh. absolutely thrilled and I was absolutely thrilled. And, and I gave her the same spiel, you know, be sure that you say on there. And I actually wrote out the whole story of where I painted it and gave it um, some information. And I think that that 
that was and it was a real uh, exciting thing for the collector too. So and I've had I lived in Pakistan for three years. Really. Teaching at an American school and uh, international school. It was an unbelievably exciting, wonderful time. I fell in love with kids from all over the world. Um, you know, we have people right now on who are watching from Pakistan. Oh, and, hi. And oh, India, hi. Norway, oh, uh, Sweden, oh, United hi. Kingdom, Brazil. We got uh, people from all over watching. I've taught in so many of those countries. I think the only one I haven't yet is Brazil, but I would love to go there. So let, just send me an invitation. We'll come and teach. Yeah, I'd like uh, that. <laughs> but uh, when I was there, I sold paintings. You know, every year I'd have a sale. And some of those paintings have found their way to the, back to the United States. Some of them were probably embassy people. I don't know. And people will call me up and say, is this one of yours? <laughs> I'll say, yeah, as a matter of fact, it might be a camel. It might be a guy in a turban. Um, I love living there. It was just such an exciting time. I did Tell me go what you're doing now. Okay. Now I'm just kind of bringing some of this. It was just, I need to bring some of this up into here a little bit. Maybe I got a little too much. Oh, this is still popping out. I need to back that off just a little bit. I need to bring some more darks up into here. Um, I have a few more little things down in here. Uh, and I think I need to bring this shadow up just a tiny bit. So let, let me uh, get in here. How much okay. time are you going to have left, Eric? All right. Do we have, can you give me kind of a time zone here? About, uh, um, ten, uh, 20 minutes, probably. Oh, good. Okay, I can slow down. Um, you know, what I tell my students is it's very important that you don't get so hung up on the brain stuff, you know, the, the thinking and, oh, my gosh, I'm not doing this right. But you need to kind of paint with your in intuition. You've been listening to a lot of things. And then step back like, like Eric suggested for me to step back. And that's when you turn on your thinking brain. And um, you say, okay, the critical side comes out, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Get that out of your system and, and get that, uh, not out of your system, but you know, get those thoughts so that they're materialized. And then go back into your subconscious and paint and let your painting um, tell you what it needs. It's so important to listen to the painting. Well, listen, it's kind of funny. Um, but let, let it talk to you uh, in such a way that you're um, intuitively looking. I know that sounds funny when everybody... Okay, talking. we're going to have to take you out in the straight jacket now. Your paintings are talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you know, you're talking about the watercolor convention? Yeah. I started my career as a watercolorist um, for 32 years. I had a terrific career. And um, then in 19, 2003, uh, we were going down to uh, op an OPA convention. And um, Howard was going to take a workshop with uh, Shui Tu. And on the way down, I just felt like this is what I'm supposed to do, too. And I got down there. We went to an art store. I bought what I needed. And that started my career as a oil painter, too. So now I do both. And, oh, that was what I was going to tell you. What I'm doing on this, if you're a watercolorist, um, and I hope that you get to his convention on the watercolor. This is fantastic. Um, if you're a watercolorist, you need to realize that what I'm telling you, oils, acrylics, watercolors, and abstract painters, all of this relates. You want to romance your painting. And I'm not talking about squeaky sweet and stuff, but you want to give them a chance to engage their brain. Um, something that is a little mysterious, not quite completed, that is very intriguing to uh, oh, I the wrong color. to people's um, like 
we were talking about the writing. We'll let them visually be intrigued. What's the mystery here? Why is it this? Or what is that back there? And well, then you want, you want them to see themselves in the painting. You know, that I, yeah. I, I have a story where um, I have a painting hanging in my sister-in-law's house. And every person who walks in says, oh, I know just where that is. That's where I grew up. Or, or you know, and, and so everybody's got a story. None of them are right. But <laughs> they see themselves in it. It, it has yeah. some meaning to them. And that's, and that's when the romance really makes it work because they, you know, they hearken back to a better time or a different time oftentimes. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, some of the, there's, I've come up with like 42 different concepts that you can do with, but if you start with a game plan and that's what I call my concepts is you have a game plan, you know, of course we're going to win the painting, but what is it? You have to ask yourself, what do I want to say? And it was too obvious about the, the bridge. It was too obvious. I wanted them to first, from across the room, this is going to hit them. This is going to point you up. Once you see that, you keep coming back to it. You keep coming back to it, no matter how you get it up yeah. to it. Um, and, and that's the sort of thing that intrigues people. Okay, let's see. I'm questioning this. Yeah. You know what happened? Uh, I just want to point something out to you. When you when you took that dark and reduced it down under the bridge, it made the rust on the bridge stand out. And oh. so it, it's just enough it says to you, "Oh, that's a rusty rickety old bridge." Yeah. Yeah. Well, I try to use complementary colors, which I'm going to get into right now. Um in my painting, it adds this the, the warmth in here. There's not a lot of color back in here. But that warmth is what really helps. You know, that, that feels very watercolor-like in the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yet nothing is translucent in this painting. It's all uh, maybe a little bit back in there originally. But, yeah, I think the in each medium that you use will teach you something. When I went into sculpture, oh, my gosh, I was so focused on form. And then when I got back into painting, um, I put more form in my paintings, which I really love. And then when I um, did sculpture for a while, I began to miss the color. You know, we have such wonderful color that we can use. I mean, you could tint your sculptures, I suppose, but... Um, they used to do that. Yeah, I know. You did? No, I didn't. No, I'm saying they used to. The back in the old days, a lot of those old Roman sculptures they actually had painted. That's right. Yeah, definitely they had painted. Yeah. Um, actually, all the patinas that are on sculptures are um, a form of painting, but it's translucent because they use all kinds of acids and stuff to make it really pop up. Um, the bronze itself is pretty dull. But yeah, I lived in Loveland, Colorado for a while. And um, I taught at the American Academy of Art there. American Academy, that's where I went to school. Um, I taught at the uh, Loveland Academy of Art. Mm. Um, oh, I got to know Richard Schmidt and Nancy, and they were living there for a little while, um, not far from the. Uh, I was living and um, I could go in and take his classes for free because I was an instructor. Oh my gosh, it was great. And um, now I forgot what I was going to say. Anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't that important, <laughs> but it was uh, something about the academy. Well, we were talking about sculpture. Oh yeah. Were. And so they had a foundry right there. That's what got me into it. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, that's what got me into sculpture was the foundry was right there. And um, I had always loved to do that. My dad was a sculptor and a painter. Really? Yeah. He, um, he died way too young, just about the time that his career was starting. Now, see, that's too dark. See that? So I'm going to take oh. it just a little bit. Um, if you guys are enjoying this, make sure to put a heart or a like. Uh, that would be really helpful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that would be make my day. And make sure to visit uh, susanblackwood.com and you can find out about her classes and workshops and everything. 
Oh, here's another thing about um, concepts, which I'm going to be teaching a class uh, in a couple, a uh, month and a half maybe, is if you have your thick paint here, not back there, um, see like that? It, be sure when you're putting on thick paint, you're using hor as many horizontal or diagonal strokes as you can if you want that uh, and thick, thick, if you want the light to catch it, because when you do that, you're creating all these little shelves. Yeah, that's a little bright. Let's take that down a little. Um, you create all these little shelves for the light to catch, and right. it, it sparkles. To, I've seen a lot of people, they get this nice thick paint going hor uh, diag uh, vertical, and it just isn't, oh, that's not quite working. Um, I've never heard that. That's every time I, every day, there's something new I've never heard. Well, I've been keeping I'm thinking, notes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a book from all these dailies oh, with all the content cool. because there's so many principles that I keep learning. Well, here's another one. In your shadows, use vertical strokes. I didn't do that very well here. If you use vertical strokes, they don't catch light, and they and keep your shadows thin, keep your light thick, and then that makes a huge difference. Okay, now I don't know if that's a too bright. Might be. Back it off. Back it off. Keep a little bit of sparkle. I'm going to add some thick to these rocks. Okay. Okay. Well, you're at about, you got about 10 minutes. Oh, good. I can go slow and add the thick. <laughs> so in other words, I'm going to mix up some light color. That might be a little too light. It's a little green in it. Okay. In other words, I got this nice thick gooey with a cat hair. I don't know if you could see it when I was talking to Eric, but there's a cat. Yeah, we saw it. What's the cat's name? That is Annie. Annie. Yeah. So, in other words, its tendency would be to come down and do a stroke like that, right? Yeah. Missing the chance to catch the light. So, if instead, look at the difference right now. I'm getting strokes in there. I'm a little jagged because it's a rock. Do another one. See how that one doesn't have as much paint. So, by making it, by going across horizontally, the paint's going to be. It's going to stand out more. It catches little shelves of light. It's like, um, yeah, they just, they pop. Um, huh. But you have to have it thick. Thins doesn't matter. But thick, do, you put, do you put any kind of medium in it, or is it straight out of the tube at that point? Nah, I'm not putting any medium in it, yeah. So but This is a vertical one, but so and this one is a slope, and I, I, it's not catching as much light. So I didn't even worry about that, but I kind of wanted it to be catching right in some of these spots. When you have a rock pile, don't try to be catching every single edge of the rock. You might even want to invent a few edges just so that it's real intriguing. Now see how much more interesting the painting is with this pushed back and this coming forward. Yeah. It's natural. I mean, you, you're walking along and you don't want to trip on the rocks. You're watching the rocks. And then all of a sudden you look up and you go, oh, my gosh, look at that bridge. That's the hope anyway. Okay, now I saw something else that I wanted to do. Hey, you know, I still, I need to be brave and push those, push those beams back just a little more. You okay. know? Good news, it's dry underneath. I can always wipe it out. I think I learned that thick and thin stuff from, mm, I think I want to say Sh Schmid was teaching that uh, at the academy. What a painter. And Nancy, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that um, I really like, that's too bright, really liked about um, 
Schmid's work was there. At that point, I wasn't even doing oils. I was sitting in on his classes, but I was just fascinated with what he had to say. Yeah. And um, it, it just all applies, no matter what you're doing. So those watercolors out there, pay attention. This is this is for you. I think I'm going to lighten this just a little back in here. And maybe bring up, all I have to do is take a little thinner, I think. Since this is a dry painting, I can come back in here, I think, and bring this up. No, I can't, can't see it. Oh, can't see it. My head's yeah. in the way, right? Yeah, it was. So we want to we want to see the magic happen. Right. Well, I, I need you to tell me when I step. That's that's terrific. Okay, oh, yeah, so right back in here, I think I can. I've always said that it takes two to paint a painting. One of you needs to stand next to what somebody needs to stand next to the painting, the painter, and knock them senseless when the painting's done, because we, you know you can overdo, overpaint. You know, you should, when you should have stopped 15 minutes ago. or And it's really good to put your painting someplace, like I, like in the living room or if your studio is not part of the uh, walkway every day, put it someplace where you can look at it and um, glance at it as you walk by. Because when you're painting our eyes get used to what we're looking at. You can really see the sunlight when you put that yellow in there with that light, especially right there. Boy, that really popped. Yeah, it made it went from a dull scene to a little brighter. I'm going to put that over here too. That's what I call a jewel. Yeah, a jewel. Yeah. You just it's amazing how little it takes to bring that sense of light back in here. See that in there. We're talking about white with just a little bit of um, yellow in it. I'm sorry you can't see my palette today, but I'm not right. doing anything that spectacular. When you take classes from me, um, you can see it. cameras that you can see that and my reference and all of that. Yeah. I tried to find my reference picture from that day. By the way, plein air painters, be sure you take a picture of your um, what you're painting because... You never know when you're going to want to go back and uh, revisit it. I think it's also, I have paintings where I can't remember where I did them. Yeah, right. And yeah. so uh, you can actually, on your phone, you can you can get the GPS coordinates and you yeah. can write the GPS coordinates on the back. That way you can always map it and find it. Oh, is that a great idea? And you can create your own personal private Google map uh, and, and mark spots that you've painted. And then, you know, eventually you'll have a lifetime of spots you can go back to, even throughout Europe and Russia and everywhere else. Well, isn't that neat? Because if somebody wants to go go see the spot that you painted. Yeah. Uh, so we got about three minutes left. Three minutes. Okay. See that square right there? Yeah. Break off the corner. Yeah, that sharp edge was drawing me. Yeah. And it, it that maybe that whole thing was a little bit too much. Well, I wish we had a before and after shot because the oh, see. Oh, really? Oh, uh, because the people who came in late. That? Oh, you have one. <laughs> wow. I knew that you would actually, actually, I'll do it better. This is the way it was. Da -da -da. Yeah. And this is the way it is. Yeah. What a difference. All right. Well, why don't you come back on camera and we'll okay. say goodbye because you're done. I am done. Uh, I don't have to tell you when you're done. I'm telling you. <laughs> I am done. Done, done, done. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. I have enjoyed it immensely. And um, yeah. And it's been great. It's been great having you. You know, you and I got to know each other. I mentioned this when Howard was on the other day. Um, we had the first publisher's invitational in Austin. You and Howard came, and there were about I think 17 of us total and, and everybody who was there has become either was already or has become pretty well-known painters. And uh, gosh, 
been, and that's that's been I don't know 12 15 years ago I think but we should have a reunion <clears throat> well we I'm having a reunion this summer of the you know I turned it into an event I get about 100 150 people in the Adirondacks every spring yeah, I know and I've funny. done that event for 10 years so this this year is going to be the 10 year reunion of that event uh, it's called sorry. the Publishers Invitational. You guys, if if you're uh, you're around, come back come back east and in the Adirondacks and come hang out. It's not as far as it used to be. The Air- Arkansas is now much closer. Oh, to- I get it. Oh, yeah. Well, that's right. Well, I drove from Arkansas to the uh, from the Adirondacks to Arkansas because my son is in school there. So it's about oh, a two, about a two day drive. Wow. Wow. Susan Blackwood, thank you so much. Everybody give her a thumbs up and applause. Susan, if you do any more work on that painting and finish it up, uh, post it in the comments. You know, a lot of people will be checking in later tonight. And so